don't forget to find the hidden clue and put what it is with the timestamp in the comments to be entered into the giveaway. All right, now grab yourself some popcorn because as of now, it's time to slip into a mind that's not our own. Let's go. On a bitterly cold winter day in 1999, the small town of Krahulov in the Czech Republic was struck by a horrifying mystery. Vladimir Bastille, a hard-working man on his way to work, seemingly vanished into thin air. His footprints in the snow led to nowhere, abruptly just disappearing as if he had been snatched up by some invisible force. Panic and confusion swept through this quiet little town as people wondered what could have happened. Eyewitnesses reported seeing Vladimir walking along the desolate road at dawn, his figure illuminated by the pale moonlight. And then just a few hours later, his co-workers realized that he never showed up for work. And the abandoned house where he was supposed to be stood ominously there with its lights off, leaving no clues of Vladimir's whereabouts. Fear and unease spread through Krahulov like wildfire, as word of Vladimir's mysterious disappearance spread. So his boss was immediately notified, but no one could explain how a man could vanish into thin air on a clear winter morning without a trace. And as fear gripped Vladimir's boss as he arrived at his employee's house, knowing something was terribly wrong, he decided to search every inch of that deserted home, finding only untouched breakfast and a cold cup of coffee on the table. So at this point, desperate for answers, he had an idea. So he released Vladimir's faithful dog from its leash, hoping that it could lead him to its owner. And so the dog was pulling ahead eagerly, following a trail of footprints in the fresh snow that led away from the house and towards Vladimir's place of work. And the further away that they traveled, the more chaotic and erratic the prince became until so suddenly the prince stopped altogether. And that's when the dog was just whimpering and growling, refusing to leave this ominous spot on the road. With this sinking feeling, Vladimir's boss picked up the trembling animal and carried it all the way back to the village. And like I said, as sun rose, panic spread through this town like wildfire. And the police were immediately called as an intense search of the area began. Every single inch was scoured by determined officers, firefighters, and even residents from neighboring villages that just joined in to help. But not one single clue could be found about Vladimir's disappearance. And as weeks passed by with no progress made in the search, eventually it was reluctantly called off until the snow melted in the spring. But even then, the police continued to comb through every inch of the area, the forests and the lakes and even abandoned buildings, searching for any sign of what could have happened to poor Vladimir. But they found nothing, not even a trace or any evidence of a crime, just this eerie silence that seemed to hang over this village. Not to mention, a couple of days after Vladimir's disappearance came, this strange barking of all the dogs echoing throughout the streets happened day and night. It was these unnerving sounds that sent shivers down the spines of the villagers as they wondered if it held any connection to Vladimir's mysterious disappearance. Plus, going back after just three days of searching, Vladimir's faithful dog mysteriously also vanished without a trace, which just added to this chilling mystery surrounding the disappearance. So desperate for answers, his family clings to these paranormal theories that they've always believed in. That their beloved son was taken by aliens or somehow slipped into another time or dimension. Believe it or not, Vladimir himself was the only skeptic in the family, refusing to entertain such far-fetched ideas about aliens and stuff like that. And the police, well, the police have their own theories, suggesting that he may have been struck by a car and his body disposed of elsewhere. 
However, skeptics argue against this possibility, pointing out that there would be clear evidence of an accident, yet there was none. So as the days turned into weeks and the weeks into months, it seemed that the truth behind Vladimir's disappearance may never be revealed. And his family can only hope for closure someday, praying for some shred of information that will bring them peace after losing their loved one in such a perplexing way. Our next story starts off February 1997 in New York City. 21-year-old Fordham University student Patrick McNeil and his friends decide to blow off some steam over some drinks at a favorite student watering hole called the Dapper Dog. Because the bar's lax ID policies made it a hot spot for underage drinking. Records confirm that the group was drinking late into the night until Patrick himself is witnessed emerging clearly highly intoxicated, stumbling onto the streets at approximately 2 a.m. And when Patrick fails to surface on campus or contact friends and family for over a week, these ominous concerns were raised. So local detectives scoured hospitals and shelters initially suspecting standard alcohol-induced memory loss or mishap. But 10 days of canvassing passed without any sightings of the handsome student known for both his athletic and his academic talents. And as the days turned to weeks, turned to months without any clues, a cloud of unthinkable tragedy hangs over all of it. Then finally on the 14th of March, a sudden macabre revelation. Patrick's lifeless body discovered floating in a remote Brooklyn waterway utterly bewildered investigators. For one, the corpse was found on its back, which was atypical for drowning victims. Fully clothed, wallet, and jewelry was intact. That kind of rules out robbery. The autopsy reveals no physical trauma, no injuries that would indicate homicide. Yet, yet, closer inspection unveils bizarre anomalies leaving medical experts stunned. Patrick's body showed signs of unexplained charring along his head and torso. Additionally, fly larvae are detected in the groin area, conclusively determined to have been laid by indoor insects. This suggests that the victim's body was kept in an enclosed space while decomposing before secondarily winding up waterlogged in the river. In light of all these baffling autopsy findings contradicting this accidental drowning, lead medical examiner Dr. Charles Hirsch remarkably declares Patrick's cause and manner of death inconclusive. So the McNeil family launches exhaustive efforts probing their son's suspicious demise. Meanwhile, the dapper dog itself faces legal fire for serving underage students the night of Patrick's disappearance. But amidst this swirling finger pointing and accusations, the core unthinkable question remains. How and why did a healthy, athletic 21-year-old Fordham scholar allegedly drunkenly fall victim to a frozen river over 11 miles from his last known location. Even more unsettling, did dark forces intercede to deposit Patrick's imprisoned decomposing remains in that winding waterway weeks later? And if so, why? Well, in subsequent months, during routine reinvestigation of Patrick's bewildering case, detectives uncovered a strikingly similar local student demise literally one year afterward that only deepened this dread that something sadistic was stalking New York's youth. In December 1997, 19-year-old Westchester student Larry Andrews embarks with friends via train to celebrate New Year's Eve in Times Square. And like Patrick, Larry becomes separated from his companions during a late night bar festivities in fails to ever reunite. Six agonizing weeks pass before Larry's fully clothed body is recovered from the East Rivers Bay Ridge Channel, nearly the exact location Patrick was found 10 months prior. Once again, all the cash and valuables on body, no external injuries detected. 
and no forehead lacerations or related trauma seen in over 90% of drowning victims from striking objects below surface. Another prime teen life violently interrupted without explanation. And as we're coming to, I just want to mention one thing as well. I remember for last New Year's, I was looking for a New Year's story, not a month ago, about a year and a month ago. And I remember I dropped this one story and it was of a man in a similar situation where he was out with his friends drinking, all of a sudden they saw him stumbling away and then he was found kind of in the exact same thing and what was around him was also around these people. So bear with me, but I think all of these could be intersecting. Okay, so as connections rapidly link to bright young scholars vanishing off the streets before surfacing mysteriously deceased in identical remote waterways with no intoxication, violence, evidence, or logic in transit means, and wider fear spread that a serial killer could be methodically targeting students. And as we move forward to 2008, cold case detective pioneer and former NYPD investigator Kevin Gannon reactivated inquiries into both Patrick and Larry's baffling deaths through an interdepartmental task force. Partnering with university criminal justice researchers, the ambitious team aimed at resurrecting upwards of 40 unsolved cases fitting an alarming pattern since the late 1990s. Several common threads connect student victims beyond big school status or late night partying and then vanishing. All of them were high achieving scholar athlete types, often firstborn sons and with middle class backgrounds. And just like the other story that I just told you about that I did a year ago, discovery scenes frequently contain another chilling signature, which was what happened on my last video. A smiley face, style graffiti right nearby. Now is this a mere coincidence or the sinister calling card of an underground death squad, also known as the smiley face killers? I mean, some university communities leak whispers of a clandestine fraternal organization dating back a century. And through privileged recruitment, such mythic sex indoctrinates star pupils into ritualistic codes of conduct around academics, ethics, guiding campus life from the shadows. But how far will the Brotherhood go to protect its elitist existence if compromised? And do these celebrated missing student victims share hidden ties that doomed all of them? Or is a depraved fraternal death pact itself the stuff of campfire fable? Without any evidence either way, the debate rages on. But today, the McNeil Andrews cases, among many in the smiley face killer docket, remain frustratingly unsolved. Gannon and research partners continue hunting for that first smoking gun that could definitively prove whether a powerful predatory syndicate is an order or its mere statistical fluke in which extinguish so much promising youth. Now for the grieving families seeking truth and closure, it's a prolonged nightmare. Each new chilling drowning dredges memories, hoping this complex mystery plaguing campuses finds coherent resolution. Be it a diabolical cabal or random tragedy, either monster provokes lasting unease for students entering adulthood already uncertain of foes hiding in light or darkness. Because when the promising among us depart without warning or explanation, nine times out of 10, there's a sinister force at work. Thank you guys so much for listening to these two stories. But I really hope you enjoyed these stories. I hope you join the join button or Patreon, grab yourself some merch. And that's all I got for you today. I'll see you guys next time. Cheers.